Open our hearts to hear his word and to ask for his love to come upon his people. Lord God, giver of every good gift, we thank you for the gift of life and most of all for the gift of our faith. Nothing else in this life can give us ever greater joy than to know you and to know your Son, our Lord. As we contemplate our own lives and the lives of our church, Lord, we ask you to illuminate our hearts, fortify our wills and give us the courage to stand up and proclaim your word in you. We ask the intercession of Mary, our mother, as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, our hopes in wisdom. Pray for us, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Those who know me well know I'm a bit of a technophobe. So I very, very rarely, if ever, use a PowerPoint. So someone's put a PowerPoint together for me. But unfortunately, I don't have a clicker, so forgive me for shouting, next slide. <laughs> next slide. Okay. All right. There are not even a hundred people in America who hate the Catholic Church. But there are millions of people who hate what they wrongly believe to be the Catholic Church. Which is, of course, quite a different thing. Not even a hundred, not even a hundred people hate the Catholic Church. In case you're not familiar with these words, I should quickly point out that they are not my own. They belong to this man, Archbishop of then Father Fulton Ching. That charismatic, courageous, and confident preacher who could once boast, humbly of course, of having one of the most watched television programs in the United States during the 1950s. 10 million viewers, 10 million viewers would watch his show each week. And if you think the 1950s, that's not that long ago, that a Catholic bishop was the most watched person on television in the United States. And all he did was talk about faith and morals and have a blackboard. That's all it took. How our culture has changed, we might say. How we have lost so much, we might lament. How can we go back to those glory days, we might wonder. But the issue is this. If those were the glory days, then why on earth did Fulton Sheen feel the need to say that there are not even a hundred people in the United States who hate the Catholic Church? Because clearly by saying those words, he was responding to the perceived sense that the overwhelming majority of people hated the Catholic Church. And that hatred was threatening to grade and diminish the influence of Catholic culture. Well, we can begin to make sense of these words when we realise he said them in 1938. On the precipice of the Second World War. You can imagine the world at that time was going through a heck of a crazy time. All sorts of things were going on. The rise of Nazism, the gradual proliferation of communism. There was anti-Catholic propaganda proliferating throughout the United States in an attempt to secularize the landscape. And faced with such confronting issues, as a Catholic, one might be inclined to say we need to take refuge. Let's create some Catholic safe spaces in order to preserve the integrity and purity of the faith. And no doubt that's what many church leaders and lay faithful did. But that man saw differently. And because he saw differently, he was able to launch out into the deep, preach the gospel with beauty and simplicity, and catch a truly marvellous net of fish. It's not what we would expect. And we might say, well, how is this relevant to us in 21st century Australia? Well, I think his insight that not 100 people hate the church in Australia is true. And that the reality is not that people, especially young people, hate the church. That's not the case. It's that they've completely misunderstood what Catholic culture is. So what do we do about it? Do we withdraw? 
Do we with retreat? Do we create a safe space? Not easy. For as you know, being misunderstood, just like our Lord was, can have immense consequences. Next slide. <laughs> Let's take what is perhaps one of the most misunderstood aspects of Catholic culture. The seal of confession. In nearly every state in Australia, perhaps with the exception of New South Wales, the political machinery, that is the state governments, have sought to coerce priests under the penalty of imprisonment to break the seal of confession. Now, undoubtedly, some of these politicians are just looking to do something, something after the Royal Commission. But also, undoubtedly, the nature of confession and the confessional seal is one of the most misunderstood aspects of Catholic culture. And look, we don't have time to go into the detail, but the Vatican is very clear on this. Reiterating as recently as 2019, a confessor's defense of the seal of the sacrament is necessary even to the point of shedding his blood. It is and not only an obligatory act of allegiance to the penitent, but it's much more. It's a necessary witness, a martyrdom, to the unique and universal saving power of Christ and his church. Mercy is critical to our culture, and we have to shed our blood to defend that mercy. Because mercy is actually what the world needs most of all, but it's been completely misunderstood. Misunderstanding the seal is not new, and neither is defending it at all costs. Let me introduce you to one contemporary example. A contemporary of Fulton Sheen. His name is Father Francis Douglas. He was a Kiwi. He was a missionary who was sent to be a parish priest in the Philippines during the Second World War. And he was working in the Philippines under Japanese occupation. And he did his best to respect the rules of the Japanese, respect their rules so as to continue to preach the gospel. But in 1943, the Japanese occupants were being pushed back by American guerrilla forces. And the Americans called out to the priest and said, Father, will you come and hear our confession? Seeing this, the Japanese became very suspicious, thinking that he was not hearing confessions, but that he was a spy. They completely misunderstood what he was and what he was doing. So thinking he was a spy, they pick him up, take him into his church, tie him to the baptistry, and for three days, beat him. Beat him. What did you, what were you doing there? What did they say to you? And he just said, and the people outside the church could hear this, you have no right to ask me that question, and I cannot in conscience answer it. And the locals said it was like our Lord being scourged at the pillar. And that's where he died. But the townspeople said this, from the time he was brought back into that church, no Filipino received any ill treatment because on him they concentrated all their anger and hatred against the Americans. The Japanese soldiers focused all their anger and hatred on that misunderstood man of God. But by standing strong, Father Douglas preserved our culture preserved our faith, and because of his sacrifice, he helped rebuild an understanding in that community about the nature and the sacrosanct nature of confession. And so we must do the same. If then you were to ask me what it means to rebuild a Catholic culture in Australia, at a time when so many millions of people misunderstood and misunderstand what the Catholic faith is all about, then like Father Douglas, there are two things we must never compromise on. Truth and mercy. Truth and mercy. Truth and mercy. And indeed, we the church might be flogged, beaten and bruised at the pillars of social media, of pop culture and of political discourse. But no one really hates truth and mercy. Because truth and mercy are beautiful. 
problem is, truth and mercy are the two most misunderstood things in our society. And this brings me to another key point. Although we might lament that we ourselves and our faith have been so radically misunderstood, I think if we are going to proclaim the kingdom anew, then it's critical we do not make the same mistakes. That is to say, the mistake our culture makes. We say that the culture misunderstands us, but therefore we've got an obligation to understand what's going on in our culture. Only with that understanding can we truly evangelize. Because if we misunderstand what's going on out there, then all we are doing is going out into shallow waters where there's absolutely no fish. It might be comfortable, you know, unchallenging. Apostolically, it's a waste of time. What sort of world are we actually launching out into if we go out into the deep? Our Lord knew hearts and minds, and so we must know hearts and minds. Because if we have the inside of hearts and minds, we will be like Fulton Sheen. We will realize that people don't hate the Catholic faith. They just misunderstand it. And following Sheen's example, despite all that we might think stops us from even bothering to launch out to the deep, you know, the royal commissions, the scandal, COVID, practicing rates, young people being disinterested and disaffected, I'm convinced that this is actually the critical and pivotal moment for the new, renewed proclamation of Catholic culture in this country. The temptation, as I said, is play it safe. Play it safe, don't do too much, don't say too much, don't be apostolic too much. But as one Christian commentator, commentator said, it's when we all play safe that we create a world of insecurity. It's when we all play safe that we create a world of insecurity. And ironically, insecurity is what defines our culture most, the world out there. Insecurity is what defines also the church in Australia at times. So this is why, if we can regain the vision that Sheen had, that fortitude of that priest, Father Douglas, then there is absolutely no reason why we cannot rebuild what has been lost in our culture. Catholics, for us all, culture is all about truth and mercy. And the church is always doing its best to promote the best of humanity. Now, where does this confidence come from? Next slide, I think. We'll wait there. The opportunity, when I realised, I thought the church, this is the moment, came in 2016. I said, I was confronted with a few things that I thought, this is actually the moment for the church to step forward, not step back. And the opportunity emerged from a slightly better understanding of what was going on in our culture, what young people were feeling, and what they were gravitating towards. And surprising, because what I felt was our opportunity came when everything was going wrong in the church. The Royal Commission, you know, the, you know Everything that's gone wrong, you know, the practicing rates, in deep, all the dissatisfaction. It was in that moment I thought, something's going on here. And the trigger was my first intellectual encounter with what's called metamodernism. Now I have to say, I'm reluctant to confuse you. But it's likely most of you haven't heard of metamodernism. But you have, I'm sure, seen metamodernism. So, we'll go to the next clip. Does this look familiar? It's cringy for a minute. It's a cringy thing for a minute. <laughs> do it! <laughs> Just do it! Don't let your dreams be dreams. Yesterday, you said tomorrow. So just do it! Make your dreams come true! Just do it! Some people dream of success while you're going to wake up and work hard at it. Nothing is impossible. You should get to the point where anyone else would quit and you're not going to stop there. No, what are you waiting for? Do it! Just do it! 
Yes, you can! Just do it! Stop, Daffy. You're tired of starting. Oh my goodness, it's tired of <laughs> Stop giving up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's metamodernism. That's metamodernism. Now, Shia LaBeouf, you probably know him from Transformer movies and the like. The point is that philosophy, ideas, first express themselves in art. We go to the next slide. The Sistine Chapel. The first way we express the ideas, what we believe, is in beauty. So you think of the majesty of what the church has produced over the years. That reflects the interior life. This is heaven. This is what we're aiming for. The objective truth about justice, freedom, love, and joy. They were the traditional values that animated the human spirit, and that was reflected in art. Here's my favourite piece of postmodern art. I'm being cynical. Next to the grandeur of the Sistine Chapel, we have number work 88 by Martin Creed, aptly titled, A Sheet of A4 Paper Crumpled Into a Ball, 1995. Currently on sale, number 88, that means there's at least 88 of these for five and a half thousand. Objective truth. Objective beauty that reflects the right order of human relationship versus the anxiety and the emptiness of a postmodern world. Now, the question is, is why did that mean, the just do it stuff, become popular? Now stick with me. Next slide. <laughs> Next slide. The backstory to that clip is Shia LaBeouf's confrontation with the emptiness in his life. And he's finding that life is meaningless, so he goes in search of meaning. So he goes and Googles meaning, something like this. And what crops up is called the Manifesto of Metamodernism. And there's about eight principles. They are all very esoteric, and this is the first one. Intellectually, metamodernism comes out of the sense that Postmodernism was dying. That people have got, they don't want a blank piece of paper anymore. They don't want to distrust all truth. They want something to believe in, but are not prepared to go back to those traditional values. So he comes across this manifesto. And the first article of this manifesto, and a manifesto arises when people need something to believe in, something to commit to. The first article of this manifesto says this. We recognise oscillation to be the natural order of the world. We recognise oscillation to be the natural order of the world. Well, what the hell is that about? Well, it's simpler than it sounds. Oscillation means to swing. It just means to swing. So think of a clock that swings like a pendulum. That's oscillation. This is the natural order. Or if you think like... A fan, you know that sort of moves mm, like that? Yeah, that's an oscillating fan. It goes in a regular pattern between two things. So the claim today is that young people are neither objective or subjective, modern or postmodern, idealists or cynics, but rather they swing between the two. They swing between the two. Sometimes they're objective, sometimes subjective. Sometimes cynical, sometimes idealist. Sometimes... They hold the absolute virtue of justice. Sometimes they say it's all power games. Now, if you go back to that meme video, the point is that Shire is trying to be both sincere and insincere. You think the sincerity in his tone, just do it, sincerity. But he's actually using sincerity as a disguised attack to be insincere about fitness culture. In particular, Nike. No, just do it. He's mocking it, but using sincerity to hide his insincerity. That's the metamodernism, right? No, it's a celebration of this pendulum, swinging one to the right, to the left. My question is, is this actually a contradiction? Now, you might think, what on earth does this have to do with God and rebuilding Catholic culture? 
But remember what I'm saying, we're trying to understand what's going on out there in order to evangelise effectively. So I encounter this at Oxford. Shire and his two closest collaborators, the person who wrote the manifesto, come to Oxford. And I watch them present at the Oxford Union. When they got to Oxford, what they did is stand in a lift for a day, creating art by letting people just walk into the lift. And that was the art they were creating. If we show the little clip. So if we go next slide, and then next slide. Because even if you never get there, there's something really instructive uh, or incisive about living as if, right? Like, uh, like I pray at night when I'm scared, even though science tells me there's no God. But I still pray. I don't know why, it's just something I do. And I feel like I'm a better person because of it. I know God's like a, a not a good topic in this room, uh, but you know, I mean, no, I don't believe in him and, or her or it, and yes, I do. I mean. So, so there's this, the oscillation, and we, he's actually being robustly honest. This is why I quite res I respect him, because I think he's actually saying what a lot of people do. On the one hand, they live as if science has told them they don't need to worry about God. But deep down, they know there's something there and they pray. They pray. So is this oscillation, or is this word oscillation just actually a cover for accepting a contradiction? So the interviewee pushes him a bit further. We go to the next slide. And the next one. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, if you look at religion for what it is, which is a creative act, Right? Religion is man-made, we know this. Uh, so in that regard, it's, it's artwork. It's really strong art. Um, and so if you look at it that way and you see it as something man-made, then you start thinking about, well, okay, well, I can craft my own. And so that's what I've been doing in my life, is sort of crafting my own idea or conception or religion and converting into my own religion. Right? So like, I've gone about it like a Wikipedia strategy. You know? Like religiopedia, you know, I'm just taking, you know, the good bits from every different thing and sort of making an amalgamation of something I can get down with. The alternative is depressing. He actually swears then. So there's, he, he's very honest. He says the alternative, if I don't have the ability to some, somehow create a god, something to believe in and pray in, the alternative is effing depressing. And what he's confronting, I think what he's brought to the fore, and when I was there watching this with the students, he was confronting the emptiness that had arrived in our culture. And, but, you know, rather than commit back to those objective values, what we have to do is just conjure up our own God, our own subjective God. And I really felt that, you know, people were, when they were listening to this, it was bringing that emptiness to the fore. Is it oscillation or is it just a contradiction? Because the irony is, he says, the God's created. I'm just creating the God, but I can't live without him. So I remember feeling so struck that night and watching how the students engage with this. And what was becoming clear to me, not just from this, but from my conversations, observations and reflections, was that the culture was crumbling. Within the academy, there was this uncertainty where are we going to go next? Postmodernism is dying. What's going to come next? <laughs> this, this was the, one of the alternatives, and a popular alternative. And young people, well, I could sense, were wanting something to commit to, a manifesto, something to believe in. But the word that kept coming to mind as I was listening to this was insecurity. And the insecurity was being covered over by this strange attempt to oscillate contradict between the restoration of those big ideas that have been lost, that the big ideas that, were, that our Western civilization was founded upon, and the subjectivity of what we call postmodern paper scrunching. So to summarize, what I think is happening is that young people and our culture more broadly are effectively embracing a contradiction. And when you're ready to live your life according to a contradiction, then you will always be, deep down, profoundly insecure. Unable to reach out, unable to launch out, unable to put out into the deep. Let me give you three examples. Sex, money and politics in, in metamodern culture. 
Now, every time I broach this with my philosophy students, they all say that they think this meta-modern phenomenon actually says a lot about how young people behave, without even knowing it, because of the influence of social media, influence of art, and so forth. And so let's briefly illustrate this contradiction in those three things. Is it oscillation, as they claim, or is that just a buzzword for contradiction? Think of the issue of sexuality. The principal argument during the same-sex marriage debate went something like this. Your sexuality is assigned at birth. You are gay, straight, or something in between. So if you are born gay and you love someone, why not get married? And you're cruel to deny that. You're cruel to deny their nature. It's their nature. That was the argument. But the same society that extols people for living according to their nature also says there's no such thing as gender. In fact, the WHO, the, what the World Health Organization on its website says, it is just a social contract. There's no such thing as male nature or female nature. Certainly not born with it. So is sexuality our, our, our identity, is it something we are born with or is it something constructed? The same people use both arguments. Contradiction or oscillation? The issue of money, and this is sort of a political issue too. During the COVID-19 crisis, the government has spent an incredible amount of money protecting the lives of the elderly and the vulnerable, which has vast, vast economic implications, the money for the vaccine rollout, all the testing. And yet at the same time, as we speak tonight, the government is legislating euthanasia, which undoubtedly, at least in part, is motivated by a desire to reduce the spending of healthcare on the dying, because the, the budget that, uh, that goes to palliative care is about 10%, it's a lot of money. Oscillation or contradiction? Politically. There is all this rhetoric about the freedom of rights and our freedom culture, and legislation is constantly being pushed forward saying it's about being pro-choice, about being compassionate and charitable. And yet legislation at the same time is continually pushed through that attacks the freedom and rights of the most vulnerable, the poor and the defenseless. We're all about protecting children, they say, but so many countries that have legalized euthanasia, it's handicapped children that are killed. Perhaps then, metamodernism is a word that communicates contradiction. For in each of those instances, society presents itself as being beholden to something bigger, a higher value. But then on the other hand, it ridicules those values and destroys them, contradicts them. And I think that insecurity there is, reflects a deeper emptiness. And this is what we have to expose as a church. The church can do this because particularly in a post-COVID world where people have had to stop and be still, these things will come to the surface. This brings me to my last section. The question is then, in light of all this, if what I'm saying, even as a modicum of truth, how do we rebuild a Catholic culture? Well, we have to understand it, as I kept saying. Even if it's just a grain of truth, even if we have a grain of truth about what's going on about there, it will help us to evangelize effectively. How do we then restore a Catholic culture in a meta-modern world that is besotted with contradictions? Well, I think the first thing is that we point out how impoverished our culture has become, how destructive that culture is, if you can still call it a culture, to confront, expose the emptiness that is there. And into that emptiness, we want to bring the person of Jesus Christ, the fullness of Jesus Christ. Give us, we should have the confidence that we have something to offer. And that's time. Because this discourse is looking for commitment. People are looking for commitment, but settling for contradiction. So when we speak of the Catholic culture, what we are saying is that Jesus Christ and his teachings can illuminate, transform, and redeem all aspects, all elements of human life and human endeavor, and put them on a right, joyful, and true and ordered path. Yes, this is a mammoth task, but we can start by getting some think simple things straight in our hearts and minds. Let's draw some practical inspiration from those two individuals I introduced you to, Fulton Sheen and Francis Douglas. 
Very broadly speaking, those two men contributed to the rebuilding of Catholic culture by breathing Jesus Christ back into the world. Bishop Fulashim imitated Jesus Christ by being courageous enough to try to help people understand the beauty of the faith. When many people would have said, what's the point? We're hated. Everyone hates us. Why bother? Father Douglas imitated Christ by being courageous enough not to compromise the beauty of the faith, even when people did not understand it. Where many would have said, what's the point? Just save yourself. Change the teaching. To help people to understand and to be persecuted when we are not understood is the exact opposite of metamodernism. Because there is no swinging there. There is no oscillation. There's no trying to escape contradiction. Only a commitment to truth and mercy. This is the manifesto the world needs. But the only way we turn that trajectory around is if everyone here has an ecstatic and burning love for God. My imagery is the road to Emmaus. Two disciples walking away from the action. They're walking away from it. They've lost their hope. Oh, we thought Jesus was the one. Oh, we thought we, we, we misunderstood what he was up to. Everyone hates us now. So they go looking for their safe space away from Jerusalem. But there is at least a gap in their hearts for them to finally recognize what Jesus is doing. And what do they do? Their eyes are suddenly opened, and they ask each other, you know, when we were talking to Jesus, did not our hearts burn as he walked with us along the road and opened up the scriptures? And as, you know, we might be tempted to walk away from launching out into the deep. That's what our Lord is doing. Walks along the road and burns, and lights the burning flame back into our hearts. No oscillation here. Just a burning fire which makes them turn around and do the exact opposite. And this is exactly what the, this, the church in this country needs. To turn around and prepare to help others to understand and to risk being misunderstood and to pay the price. That fire that we should have in our hearts is love. Eros in its truest sense. That is to say, when we say eros, erotic desire, what we mean by that is when we forget ourselves completely and run towards the other without any regard for ourselves. That's what launching out into the deep is. Every eyewitness, I selfishly beg and pray for more vocations to the priesthood. Maybe after this I might be tempted to do something, we'll see. Anyway. <laughs> That, that in this culture, when young men, you know, might be, oh, you know, I'm walking away, you know, I forget about it. What I need is hundreds of young men, particularly young men, for the priesthood and religious life, to turn around and join the cause. It will be the single greatest shock to this country if vocations to the priesthood and religious life increase. To conclude... It is very tempting in our times to play our Catholicism safe. To reduce our call to holiness to a little bit more than a pious ideal, rather than to dare to believe and discover our true destiny. It's tempting to write off Christ's teachings as too hard, too outdated, rather than to dare and believe and discover that they are source, they are the source of true joy. It's very easy to excuse myself from the sacrament of penance rather than to dare to believe and discover that this is the means to experiencing true mercy. To speak about the genius of Christ and his church only from the confines of churches or conferences is not enough. Rather, we have to dare to believe and discover that there is no greater use of your voice, no greater use of your talents, no greater use of your life than to proclaim and defend the genius lovingly, boldly, unashamedly, in a world that is crippled by self-doubt, indecision, and spiritual insecurity. So tonight, I implore you and I, do not give in to the temptation to safety and insecurity. Do not diminish your faith to lip service or to a cacophony of human traditions. No. 
Our Catholicism has to be intrinsic to our identity. It has to permeate everything about the way we live and define who we are above all else. In other words, a strong, robust Catholic identity is the antidote to the insecurity in the church and our world. For no one is attracted deep down by metamodern insecurity. No one is attracted by a constant rhetoric of being in decline. But everyone, everyone is attracted by an unwavering fidelity and a truly Catholic conviction. That's it. I feel like I'm on the edge of a boat and Father Greg has just gone. <laughs> and I'm in that deep water. Good. Spicy, caliente, personally attacking, maybe a little bit head knowledge. I'm really, really grateful that you are here and you always push us to go outside of ourselves, outside of um, what we think we know and what we think we should do and how we think we should be. Um, and I really love your fire. So thank you, Father Greg. Um, <laughs> Yeah, great. Now, um, does anyone have any questions for Father? Oh, okay, already out the back. I might give you the microphone. Thanks, Father. Yeah. That's right. I've done like so many funerals where people come to the church looking for meaning and they'll say, Oh, Father, yeah, lovely. I'm sure she's up in the sky having tea with Dari and others. <laughs> look up at the sky there, she is at the star, that's the star. Well, look, and, and you can see it's you know, they might live their lives as practical atheists or agnostics, but they can't deny the reality there's something within them that desires the transcendent, something that's sort of reaching out for meaning. What metamodernism does, as I think this is becoming a lot more pronounced in our culture, is that whereas in former times people would be, would be more inclined to ridicule, absolutely ridicule, the idea of the transcendent and mystery, there is this turn within the culture now towards mystery. Like even the manifesto itself is so esoteric, it's got this mysterious flavour to it. And it's because it's weird and funky, people are attracted to it. So. Um, in terms of answering your question, I would probably just point out the inherent contradiction in what they're saying. So what evidence do you have for that? Or why do you believe that? Uh, is this just a pious idea? What's that saying about you? Is there something within you that's pushing you towards this? Uh, a desire for the supernatural? But if they have an intellectual persuasion, then maybe go for your life, yeah. Is he? Yeah. Well, let's see what he does to poor old Padre Pio. Goodness me. <laughs> yeah. That might be, yeah. That might be, yeah, metamodern twist on bilocation. <laughs> yes. Well, I have a question in a statement. Yeah. It was actually on that. I was going to say, did you know that Padre Pio, Shane or Lewis, many converted to Christianity after playing the role of Fury and then now is playing Padre Pio? So that seems to have a bit of a conversion. So, yeah, I did some research into, a little bit of research into this. I don't know, I know talk, they, once they were talking about this conversion to Christianity, I'm not sure what he means by that. Yeah. And I do think there might be, again, a metamodernist meta spin, because as he says, what he does, he looks out at all the religions and picks the bits that he likes to create his own religion. So he might be Christian in that sense. Um, but yes, but yeah. Uh, 
um, my question was, um, yeah, you said early on, like in the glory days, when Bishop Fulton changed yeah. the broadcast to tens of millions, but there was still that hate for the Catholic Church. Yeah. What's changed now in that we still have that same hate, but there's not that like mainstream appreciation for it like nowadays? Well, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that there could be. So what Fulton Sheen was doing, what he realised was that, you know, we, we've, we often create the narrative about what's going on out there. And often the way we think, what we think people think of the church is fueled by the media. And the media always wants to present the idea it's, it's the world against the church. But my experience is, invariably, very, 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 very rare do I find someone that really hates the church. Most people are actually quite willing to engage or interested. Uh, so I actually say what we need is a bit, be a bit more like Fulton Sheen saying, hold on, you know, this, maybe this is wrong. Maybe there are only 100 Australians that really hate the church. The majority uh, will be quite willing to be engaged. Uh, so, but the thing is that once you've convinced yourself the world hates you, it changes the way you speak. You become a lot more afraid, very timid. Uh, so you, you're not prepared to take risks. So what you do is you generally build towers, office spaces, and you hide behind the desk and create brochures or something like this, rather than full and say, let's do something really radical, turn around like the road of Emmaus, and do something that everyone thinks would be impossible. Uh, that's the inspiration, I think, that we can draw from that. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, it really depends on your friends. So you, what you don't want to do is sort of be overbearing to intimidating. My, my experience is generally they ask the questions. So once they see there's something a bit different about you, or you behave a bit differently, or you have a particular opinion on a moral issue, um, they ask the questions. The, the biggest issue, and I think you sort of touch on this, is actually overcoming indifference. A lot of, a lot of people, are, no, they don't have bad will. They're just indifferent. And I, the only way I can sort of shake them out of this, and I, even when, when like, you know, in Catholic schools and things like that, is I just keep pinpointing that, don't leave these great questions to the last minutes of your life. Because the number of times where I've been helping someone to die, and then they'll say, Father, I you know, really regret that I've waited so long. Uh, only in those last moments uh, do we then think, hold on, my priorities are rearranged. I should have thought a bit more deeply about you know, what, does God exist? Uh, what, uh, what does that mean? What implications does it have for my life? But the way the culture is designed, is it, uh, the, our secular culture, and I don't like that word, it's conditioning us not to ask those questions. Keep you busy. Because a, a capitalist economy works by buying and selling. So you need to be, keep constantly busy so that you're constantly attracted to the next thing to buy and sell. And that's what people, that's the very powerful narrative that people live their lives according to. So, so yeah, in terms of practical examples, it depends. Sometimes I'm very robust and say, oh, well, what, what do you believe happens when you die? Uh, do you believe in God and why? And I often say to people, I don't really care what they believe. Ultimately, I want everyone to be Catholic, yeah. But I'm much more interested, have you given the time and space to think deeply about these questions? And if you can give me a decent answer, I'll respect that. Most of the time, it's, oh, I don't know. Oh. No, it's like the tea party up in the sky. And these often are quite you very accomplished, intelligent people. But, you know, rarely do they raise those questions. Yeah. Yes? Um, I've heard that natural law is a blunt tool. And oh, yes. A wax nose. Yeah, and can't be used to um, help rebuild culture. And so I was wondering, oh dear. Uh, can we use uh, natural law, new natural law theory, to help rebuild the culture? And how would we do that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. Father, we need more John Spinner. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, I believe, of course I believe in the natural law. Um, in fact, that's what I was talking to, like, I talked about what, what, when, we, when, we, when we come up with contradictions, when we break the natural law, when we move away from it, that's when we end up in contradictions. The presence of contradictions suggests that we have pushed far too, uh, we move far too far away from the natural law, keeps us on the right path. Now, what do you refer to? Do I believe that a purely rationalistic approach to the natural law will work. Well, I think it might have limited success. What, what I'm much more interested in is articulating the beauty 
of the natural law. So, look, the problem with something like, and this is my, my, a lot of my doctoral work was on natural law, so this is why it's, a, again, I could easily go, if you think that metamodernism is bad, no, that's, um, natural law is even more precarious. I think sometimes we've misunderstood the culture. So rather than think, seeing natural law as something theological, the tendency has to be saying, look, well, let's make it as philosophical as possible because that's what will persuade people. Now, I would say, show me if that's been successful. We run, we run these arguments. Does it persuade? And if you can show me it persuades, then I think, yeah, you've got value. You've got value. But half the issue is, how do you get people to understand the natural law, right? Particularly a theory like um, new natural law, which is, got, you know, it's, it's supremely rich, intelligent, but it's immensely complicated. It's a very elitist. So it might work in certain quarters, certain political quarters, but, you know, um, the idea of secularizing theological language, I think, is dangerous because ultimately you empty the language of theological content. And it's actually that theological content that gives it its robust meaning. <laughs> it's that, that is a, a question I could get into a lot of trouble answering. <laughs> we might just have one more question. I know there's a lot, but... Ooh. So you choose. Sister had a question. Sister Anastasia, is that you? Very small proportion, very committed to Christianity. Very small proportion, hate Christianity. Yeah. Huge numbers in between. And of that huge middle, there's a huge proportion that are very open to learning more, yeah. being invited, talking about matters of faith, changing their religion even. So, um, Father, I'm not sure if you're referring to those, but I thought that was helpful to know because when I read that, it just cut through that media um, narrative of... Yes. You can't talk about this. That's the unpermitted, non-permitted topic. Yeah, that's right. So I often think sometimes the strategies we've used to try and argue on their terms have actually, we've shot ourselves in the foot. Because only what we're wanting to do, we're trying to rebuild a Catholic culture. Jesus Christ has to sometime venture in there. He has to feature at some point. Um, so sometimes I think when if we've tried to rationalise our tradition to such an extent that Jesus is like an afterthought, I think that's problematic, and I, and I do wonder whether we might be more effective. It might be more effective to find ways to really present the beauty of the faith, because beauty you really can't argue with. Thank you very much. Thank you.